Hi, everyone. Uh, back again in the locker room at the whiteboard and, and uh, staying with the same theme. We're going to be talking about the threat stress response, uh, particularly uh, at this time during the COVID-19 uh, crisis. And most specifically today, I want to talk uh, about uh, uh, race, uh, as that's become a, a big issue today. Uh, where we're seeing an extremely high rate of death in uh, the Afro-American population, the black population of the United States, uh, particularly in the New York, York area. So uh, we've been uh, talking about the, uh, a model of, uh, of threat stress and how it presents in our bodies and, and in our mind. Uh, and uh, so we want to talk about how this particular model that we've been uh, referencing uh, has an implica implication in the statistics that are rolling out today. Uh, so again, in a quick summary, we've talked about all the different forms of threat uh, that come at us uh, uh, in our lives. Um, a threat uh, can be uh, through our body, if we have tissue injury or if there's a, a loud sound or a bright light or a bad taste or a bad smell, it will activate our threat response. Um, if uh, a virus attacks us, like COVID-19 virus, that is a threat uh, and it activates our threat stress response. Bacteria can do the same thing. They attack slightly different, but the response is very familiar. Lions and tigers and bears also are a threat to us and can attack us. And the threat stress response is very similar uh, for a lion, tiger, or bear attack. Other people can attack us. They can attack us physically or they can attack us spiritually. When we talk about a spiritual attack, uh, it, it can be uh, emotional uh, pain that we're experiencing uh, and uh, uh, social pain uh, and even uh, financial pain is a form of a, a spiritual attack to us. It's not a physical attack. Um, and also our thoughts, so we can have negative thoughts uh, that can continue to activate our, our threat stress response. And we've talked a fair amount about the um, subconscious brain and how much activity is going on in the subconscious brain and that we have these predictive codes in the subconscious brain that are constantly running to help us determine, even prior to consciousness, whether we're in a situation of danger, of threat, or whether we're in a safe situation. Um, we've talked also about um, suppression and repression, the fact that if we have certain thoughts or th certain emotions that kind of pop up in us, and it's really not a good time for us to express those or deal with those, uh, we'll um, go ahead and, and compartmentalize them or stuff them away and hold them at bay, uh, maybe not, not to get dealt with and just to kind of uh, exist in the, in the shadows of the mind uh, as, as uh, an, an energy that can keep activating the threat stress response. And we've talked about the amygdala being the uh, alarm, the sender of the threat response and how it sends out a, a signal and that cascades essentially throughout the body, throughout the mind, um, and um, causes a significant change uh, in our, our physiology. We talked about the fact that uh, the amygdala stimulates the hypothalamus to the pituitary to the adrenal gland and it throws out adrenaline that increases our heart rate, our blood pressure, our respiratory rate, the force contractions of our heart uh, and gets us ready to uh, fight or flee. Also, uh, the adrenal gland sends out cortisol that uh, provides uh, fuel. Uh, it takes um, uh, fuel um, by breaking or creates fuel by breaking down our tissues. Um, so that we can continue a, a fight or a flight. And then we talked about the number of chemicals in our body, um, transmitters or neurotransmitters, including noradrenaline, glutamate, histamine, and most particularly, we've been talking about pro-inflammatory cytokines and what they do to our overall um, physiology, to our physical health, and to our mental health, and particularly, particularly uh, with the COVID-19 crisis, uh, when people get really, really sick, they, they experience a pro-inflammatory cytokine storm uh, that um, causes them uh, 
to flip into essentially a mode of collapse and sometimes uh, die. And we've referred to this switch from fight or flight uh, into the, this other mode as going from fight or flight to freeze or faint, where we now start to drop our heart rate, drop our respiratory rate, drop our, um, our um, blood pressure, and we are now starting instead of uh, uh, mobilizing resources and being very re reactive and aggressive, we're moving into a, a mode where we're now trying to uh, mobilize and uh, preserve resources, um, burn less energy, uh, and to undergo a process of uh, repair, restoration, and recovery, uh, and hopefully make it through that and come back online again. Um, so um, with this, uh, this model in mind, uh, let's review here real quickly. Uh, just starting with fight or flight, uh, it's a mobilization uh, physiology. We're very reactive, if not impulsive. Um, it uh, has a high immune response, a high inflammatory response, and it's high energy uh, in production and high energy in consumption. Um, and in an infectious disease process, this is usually the, the high metabolic time of, of running a fever where your body's literally trying to kick the crap out of the virus. Now, as we, as we said, as uh, we start to fatigue or we start to lose the battle, we'll flip into freeze or faint physiology. And again, here, this is characterized by being more immobile, being withdrawn, sometimes feeling stuck. Um, sometimes actually feeling dissociated from yourself and the world and going into a frank collapse. This uh, physiology is also characterized by high inflammation um, uh, and it is a low energy production and a low energy consumption physiology. Uh, and in this state, just as all of these uh, things are sort of becoming um, you know, pushing us into more depression, that we're depressed metabolically, we're depressed in terms of our uh, mood, we're depressed in terms of our uh, mobility um, and activity, uh, and our immune system also gets depressed. So that's a dicey state to be in when you have an infection and, uh, um, and, and you're running out of gas, and all of a sudden you flip into this freezer faint physiology, now you're going to end up in the ICU, maybe on a ventilator, um, and the, we're also, you're also shutting down your immune response to, to fight the virus, but you're maintaining an inflammatory response uh, with um, the ability to cause some uh, persistent destruction to some of our tissues. Um, also, the cytokines actually make our membranes leaky, which makes it easier for the bigger sort of white cells to migrate out of the blood vessels and go attack stuff. So we start spilling fluid into the wrong spaces. You can imagine if, you know, your lungs are inflamed and now you're spilling fluid into the wrong spaces, you know, it's harder to breathe, it's harder to oxygenate, and then you're not um, taking as deep a breath or as frequent of a breath, and you're not uh, pumping your blood quite as strong, and pretty soon, that delivery system for oxygen uh, is really impaired and, and uh, people are in, in uh, tough shape. So um, with that quick summary, uh, let's go back here and, and, and talk about um, race in America. And this isn't necessarily specific um, to Afro-Americans. Uh, it is specific uh, to anybody um, who is poor, um, perhaps a minority, certainly a minority that's being discriminated against or perhaps even being terrorized. Um, and, uh, and you can see, based on the things that activate our threat stress response, um, how this might uh, play out, uh, again, to set the threat stress baseline load higher, right? So our sometimes referred to as all, allostatic load is higher at baseline and we have increased circulating cytokines. So let's move, let me, let me move, let me move out of the way and talk about what this might look like uh, in America today. 
So we talked in a few sessions back about epigenetics and the fact that we have, we give the, we have this DNA code and some of our, our, our DNA, some of our genetics uh, gives us uh, some kind of instinctive fears, you know, like the fear of height and the fear of falling, things like that that are wired into us. But we also talked about uh, how our DNA can be modified and when our DNA is modified, that's called epigenetics, so uh, we make some minor modifications uh, to our genetic code and that those modifications to the genetic code can actually get passed from generation to generation. And so our ancestors' past traumas can live on in us and uh, be um, uh, and, and, and give us a slightly higher chronic threat stress response that we're walking around with all the time. So if you can imagine that your ancestors uh, came over on a slave ship, um, uh, the terror involved in that and what that might do to your DNA, to your gen genetic uh, code. And, the, uh, and then you go through uh, generations of slavery and you can imagine what that might do. And then uh, when slavery is abolished, you go through generations of being dismissed, demeaned, and discriminated against. So you end up with uh, this uh, generational transfer of uh, threat stress and a chronic threat stress response. Let's talk about, we've already talked in past sessions about um, how that uh, presents uh, in terms of uh, deterioration in our physical and mental health. So um, we know that people with uh, an increased baseline threat stress level um, and a heightened threat stress response have more medical problems. And in past sessions, we've talked about this um, you know, multiple times in terms of kind of the the, the um, best lens or the, the one that maybe most magnifies this problem is with people with adverse childhood events uh, and that uh, they're, um, they're, they have a chronically hyperactive threat stress response. They have chronically elevated um, cytokines and histamines, let alone a little perhaps elevation in adrenaline, noradrenaline, glutamate, and cortisol. Um, and so they tend to be more predisposed to things like asthma and allergies, um, heart disease, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, autoimmune diseases like uh, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, uh, colitis, uh, more you know headaches, neck pain, back pain, um, and uh, more GI problems uh, uh, such as irritable bowel syndrome or gastroesophageal reflux disease or ulcers. So we, we know that that uh, uh, is, a, is a good model for this, and it absolutely would also apply uh, to what we're seeing in the black community today. We also uh, know uh, that poverty, uh, as we were talking about earlier with uh, financial um, pain, uh, will activate our threat stress response. Um, and then, Let's get into the, all the emotional stuff that kind of goes with this, this sense of injustice, the sense of anger, the sense of fear or anxiety, and the sense of insecurity. And I, and I put those in separate boxes. They're all, you know, a, 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 an emotional feeling, and they all uh, indicate some form of social or spiritual pain. But the reason I do this is they're represented slightly different in their location in the brain. They all activate this threat stress response and jack up our uh, excitatory uh, hormones and transmitters, chemicals, and jack up our pro-inflammatory cytokines. So, I'm living, I'm not, um, but you know, if you are living in a culture, in a society that practices um, chronic discrimination and chronic uh, injustice within, ironically, the criminal justice system, um, how would you feel uh, 
and what do you do with those emotions? Well, if you go into fight or flight and you uh, get very angry and let's say in fight, you're going to tend to be uh, a little bit more reactive, a little bit more impulsive. You're going to tend to be a little bit more oppositional, maybe even explosive. That won't go over very well. That may get you in further trouble. So uh, at some point you may learn that I need to do something with that anger and rage and I gotta stuff it away, okay? Um, or you may get into some trouble. If you are more in the flight mode, you may just be a little bit more anxious, chronically worried, hypervigilant, super concerned every time you go out and drive a car through a new neighborhood or it's dark out. Um, and, uh, and, and you have to somehow deal with that uh, chronic anxiety uh, and insecurity and, uh, and, and at some level hold that at bay so that you can function day to day. So, uh, so we have all those things. And then uh, if you are trying to hold those emotions in check, um, you're actively causing thought suppression and emotional repression, which we also know lives in this shadow of the brain, but it's that energy that we haven't dealt with that continues to poke at our amygdala and activate the threat stress response. And that threat stress response ends up with an elevated level of pro-inflammatory cytokines. So if you take a look at this list here as it stacks up, if your threshold for going into freeze or faint is right here, that's a problem. You don't have a lot of room for additional threat and stress. And you put a viral load on top of this here, Let's go up to here. Let's put COVID-19 on, on that stack of threat and stress. Think of this as just a, a layer of cytokines piling up. Uh, and now you get into uh, a little respiratory distress. You're a little bit more fearful. Uh, you go into a hospital and uh, everybody's stressed uh, and anxious in the hospital. Everybody's trying to avoid you as much as they can. They want to get you into isolation to uh, protect everybody. And all of a sudden, you're way over the top. And what happens then? We go into this freezer faint physiology where um, people get withdrawn, they get dissociated, they go into emotional collapse, but more importantly, they go into cardiovascular collapse, and, and yet they're still in a pro-inflammatory state. They've got leaky membranes and fluids starting to spill out, uh, and their immunity starts to drop, and they're having more trouble fighting the virus on their own, and that's just a setup for disaster. So, having said all that, it's absolutely predictable that we would see uh, um, people who uh, have had um, ancestral traumas at higher risk, people who have had childhood traumas at higher risk, people who have had uh, any kind of trauma during their life at increased risk, People who have financial insecurity, who are living in poverty, are at increased risk. Um, people who have any kind of mental health problem, uh, every mental health diagnosis has an elevated level of circulating cytokines, uh, they're going to be at risk. Um, people who have suffered a significant amount of what I keep referring to as spiritual pain, um, prejudice, discrimination, uh, being terrorized, being treated unfairly, they're going to uh, be at increased risk. And people who don't have um, good strategies for dealing with all of that uh, emotional baggage, which I'll argue very few of us do, um, and are relying on suppression and repression to get by every day in their life, 
are going to be at increased risk. So um, I did um, talk uh, briefly about um, what somebody in anger might look like or anxiety might uh, look like uh, in, in these cases, but I want to go back to our model here and kind of reiterate that when we go into threat stress response, we start shutting off our, our dorsal lateral prefrontal frontal cortex and our ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So this dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is kind of the equivalent of our IQ and this uh, uh, ventral medial prefrontal cortex is kind of the equivalent of our EQ. So when that happens, when we're under extreme threat stress, we become less reasonable, less insightful, have poorer judgment, we have less rational thought, we become a little more paranoid, we tend to have more misperceptions and more mispredictions, and we also tend to become prejudiced. Prejudgment, meaning that we're, we're, we're making assessments based on some predictive code that might be an error, and under threat stress, we know that we bias everything uh, to try to define the difference between us and them. And I'm going to come back to that. When we drop out our EQ, we, uh, we don't connect well with others, we don't bond well with others, we lose empathy, our ethics become poor, moral judgment becomes uh, poor, we lack remorse, and, and we have um, more difficulty uh, with making uh, difficult uh, decisions, uh, uh, particularly if there's some form of conflict involved. Uh, we become more impulsive in our decision making uh, and less uh, rational. So, um, so let's go. Let's go back to this us versus them, us versus them thing that uh, it kind of plagues us. So, um, from an evolutionary standpoint, this was an a, an advantage to us to be able to distinguish the us and the thems, right? Uh, it, it, it was built into us uh, to help with our survival is to be constantly searching for the, the things that are different uh, in us because those might represent some sort of threat that somebody's not part of our tribe. Um, and that is some of the activity that we're talking about going on in these predictive codes in the brain. So, interestingly, the more threat we're under, the more stress we're under, the more we tend to define things in this black and white uh, uh, world as us and them, uh, instead of um, uh, trying to connect with people, we're much more likely to try to repel them. And so that uh, becomes a, a problem as well. So, one of the things that we keep hearing about in the medical community uh, is that uh, um, our, our black population gets poorer care. And what are the reasons for that? I, I think that this is, this is part of the reason here. And this is something that we're not always really conscious of. We don't know this is going on in us. I mean, there's been interesting studies where people have taken and and uh, made judges hungry, which hunger is a stress, right? You're running out of fuel, you need some cortisol to mobilize some fuel. So hunger is a stress. So if you take a judge and, and, uh, and starve them and make them hungry or hangry, they're liable to give more severe uh, sentences. Uh, there's been other studies done with judges where um, they have um, uh, into their subconscious infused uh, a thought about their own mortality, about their essentially uh, created the anxiety of annihilation in them uh, uh, through different methods and then studied um, sentencing patterns. And uh, judges who have been uh, reminded of their own mortality, which may be the biggest uh, thing, uh, the biggest anxiety in all of us is that we're someday going to die, uh, then they also tend to deliver harsher sentences. So when we're under threat stress response, we're just, we're, we're harsher, 
You know, um, we aren't necessarily the human beings that we aspire to, that great moral animal. Um, and I think we have to put that in this equation as well um, in uh, the scenario that we're looking at uh, in terms of poor outcomes uh, for uh, black America in the COVID crisis. So we've got really two things going on here. We've got, we've got the issues of, of kind of our neocortex going offline and what that makes us do. And then we have this layering up of threat and stress that jacks up the cytokines. So now we've got kind of a perfect storm where somebody's coming in and they're at high risk. And because so much of this stuff is actually, you know, kind of subconscious, not obvious um, to even the patient that they have all this stuff going on. Um, uh, and because this uh, mechanism of, of biasing uh, towards prejudice and uh, discrimination and us and them is going on again in a subconscious mode, it's kind of a perfect storm for being sicker than you look and ending up getting worse care than you need. And I always go back to this point that it's very important that we understand uh, certain things about us. Our neurobiology under threat stress makes us prejudiced. We have misperceptions and mispredictions. That's biological. And, and it's not helpful to say, oh, I'm not prejudiced, but they did this. You know, that, that doesn't help. What's really helpful is come to the real, realization of what it means to be fully human and accept kind of our neurobiology and say, I'm under stress. I might be prejudiced in this moment and be able to um, try to bring yourself uh, to your senses. You know, when the, that quote that you hear all the time, she must have lost his ma her mind or I, I'm out of my mind. Literally, this is what we're talking about, the threat stress response and this part of our mind that we really value goes offline. So um, it's much better to understand what's happening to us inside that's making us be less uh, than we want to be or less than our potential. Um, all of this is part of being human. Uh, the other thing I always like to point out is, um, you know, you can take any of us and if you put us under enough threat and stress we're going to go down this path and we're going to be a different human being here than when these guys are all online and functioning you know it, it we are both we are um, both uh, kind and compassionate and insightful and creative and we're also uh, angry and mean and paranoid and prejudiced. Uh, and it all depends on where this threat stress load is hitting us. Um, so that's the big thing that I want to point out uh, today and to try to um, give further understanding to what might be happening statistically across the country um, and so that we're looking at the whole picture. I think we tend to look at this part of the picture uh, much more than we've looked at this um, stacking up of threat stress and how it hits people. Um, and when we're in us versus them, we are much more focused on the differences in us. And what we have to try to do is pull, it, pull ourselves back uh, to our commonality. And uh, our commonality is that we all want to be safe. We all want to be fully seen. We all want to be secure. We all want to be loved. And we all bleed red. We are, in fact, all the same. And um, as a coach, um, again, 
wearing my coach's hat and not my doctor's hat. Um, I've had the great privilege of, of coaching uh, in a very diverse community in, in, in the uh, city of uh, Seattle. Um, and uh, I think what happens in, a, in an environment like that, uh, you get a group of kids and uh, color is not a thing any more than being tall or short or stocky or skinny. Um, it's just used to describe uh, a kid. In fact, sometimes it's not even black or white or brown, it's just light or dark. Um, and there's no social context to it because every one of those kids uh, is one of you. <laughs> They're us. And as a coach, when you go and compete against another team, it's exactly the same way. Uh, the only thing that defines them as different as the them is uh, the color of their jerseys, not the color of their skin. Um, so that's very important to me. And I, I will uh, admit that when I see these statistics um, coming out um, and the percent uh, of um, the deaths that are amongst our uh, black brothers and, and sisters, it pains me um, because it speaks to uh, the injustices in our world, but it pains me because those deaths, those, those deaths could be some of my kids, the ones that I coached, and it pains me that they have to go through life experiencing all of these aversive emotions and having to hold them and suppress them. And so if anything comes out of the COVID crisis, it would be that, um, that we understand our physiology better, we understand who we are better and more fully and understand the commonalities and the things that we desperately want out of life and we stop the unfair practices that we continue to perpetuate for all the wrong reasons. We're perpetuating them because we're afraid and we're in threat and stress and we need to be able to stop that. And then the last thing I'll say as a coach is it's never about the competition or the winning. It's always about the passion, the camaraderie, and being adaptable and being able to cooperate. That is what our life should be about. And when you look at how we are approaching this uh, with ourselves and with other countries and the dialogue that's coming out of Washington, D.C., it doesn't speak to those values. Um, it's all about uh, demeaning people. It's all about um, competing and winning and it's not about the things that make us better human beings. And I think we need to take the time to reflect on that um, and see if we can't get this thing right coming out the other end of the COVID crisis. Thank you.